Greetings, I'm John the Spirit. Capitalism exploits your labor and provides a minimum reward to you compared to your corporate overlords. That's relevant to this episode, and welcome to Pyanodon's Recap Super Shorts. In this episode, I'm going to show you how Arch Ezekiel and I took one step closer to our train base through two powerful power systems. One of which uses coal, and the other of which uses depression. Let's start with the boring one first, coal. Our coal power plant has two main purposes, make coal and make hot air. Logistic science introduced a new stage to processing coal, which increases your fuel value drastically. Where Pi Science 1 allowed you to turn raw coal into a, a higher density fuel crushed coal, and then coal and coal dust, this new science allows you to turn crushed coal into coarse coal, which is even denser. A warning, you can also turn coarse coal into normal coal, but you lose fuel density and you also lose some fuel value. So you should be careful if you decide to do that. It's not actually a processing step that increases your fuel value, it just decreases the number of random products you have lying around. Which isn't always a bad idea, honestly. We chose, unlike my previous playthrough, not to um, power with coal dust. Instead, we collected all of our coal dust because coal dust is honestly pretty useful for something called activated carbon, which is needed for filtration media and refined syngas and a bunch of other random stuff that was fairly important, so we wanted to keep a bunch of it around. And we have a lot of it around. Like 80,000 of it? Gods, wow. The fuel we have left, normal coal and coarse coal, got sent to their own power plants. The interesting thing about coarse coal is because it was such a high dense fuel value, despite there being less of it than normal coal, most of our power plants are actually using coarse coal. Uh, never mind, that's a lie. I think the top ones all use coal, and then these bottom three just use coarse coal. Yeah, exact number-wise, we have eight um, coal power plants using normal coal, and three using coarse coal. Hot molten salt gets turned into power when it's dumped into these heat exchangers, which turn pressurized water into pressurized steam. But you can do something else with all that extra hot molten salt. You can use it to reheat coke oven gas from 100 degrees Celsius to 500 degrees Celsius. And we were, you know, when we made logistic science work, our entire base, like, exploded. We were running on prayers and wishes. Like, all of our metals started running, and then we ran out of the stuff that powered the metals, our fuel stopped working for a while, like, everything just broke immediately, and we needed to fix it all. And one of the big things that was a problem was hot air. And you can get a lot of hot air from warmer stone bricks, which come from warming warm stone bricks using 500 degree coke oven gas. The feedback loops uh, on their own, if you didn't do any reheating, are pretty interesting. 500 degree coke oven gas gets turned into 250 degree coke oven gas when it makes warm stone bricks warmer. And then you need that 250 degree coke oven gas to make stone bricks into warmer st warm stone bricks. So while your stone bricks heat up along the chain, your coke oven gas cools down over the chain. And they do so in opposite directions. Now if you have a perfect closed loop of coke oven gas, this is perfectly fine. You're not really going to get many issues with backlogs of stone bricks being in the wrong places. Because when you turn stone bricks into warm stone bricks, those have to get turned into warmer stone bricks. And when the warmer stone bricks get used to make hot air, they go back and restart the process. So every piece of 500 degree coke oven gas theoretically gets used as 250 degree coke oven gas as well. But the thing about reheating coke oven gas is that you lose a little bit of coke oven gas every time you do it which means that you have to refill the coke oven gas from an outside source. But the outside source we had provided us with 250 degrees Celsius coke oven gas. So here's the situation we ran into, and let me try and lay this out for you step by step. We'll call warmer stone bricks orange, and we'll call warm stone bricks yellow. And then we'll call the cool ones gray. To make hot air in the first place, you need orange bricks. To get orange bricks, you need 500 degree coke oven gas and yellow bricks. So the main rub comes when you're trying to figure out where to get that 500 degree gas. 500 degree gas comes from reheating 100 degree gas. So where do you get that 100 degree gas? Well, you need to consume 250 degree gas. And 250 degree gas requires gray stone bricks to run. But you're only going to get gray stone bricks if you use your warmer stone bricks. So as an extreme, let's consider the situation where we start with no 500 degree coke oven gas at all. So there's no coke oven gas in the system. Besides having no 500 or 100 degree coke oven gas, suppose you also have no gray stone bricks. You have no gray stone bricks because all of your stone bricks have been transformed into yellow bricks. And those yellow bricks are waiting for 500 degree gas to become red bricks. So you say, hmm, why don't I put some gas into this system? And the type of gas you choose to put in is 250 degree gas. It's the only gas you have access to. Well, how do you get 100 degree gas? You need to turn gray bricks into yellow bricks, but you're out of gray bricks because all of your yellow bricks are sitting around waiting for 500 degree coke oven gas. 
which you don't have because you need to burn 250 degree gas into 100 degree gas. And to do that, you need graystone bricks. It is very possible for you to run out of 100 and 500 degree gas while you have only yellow bricks because your supply of gas is from 250 degree gas. Anyway, the fix was really simple. You just get rid of your extra yellow bricks by making hot air the less efficient way. And then as soon as the yellow bricks turn into gray bricks, they can get processed into yellow bricks again. But in the process, they turn 250 degree gas into 100 degree gas. And that 100 degree gas turns into 500 degree gas. And that 500 degree gas turns yellow brick into red brick. And then your red brick can make hot air the normal way. If we really wanted to, we could put an overflow valve so that the smaller heat exchanger only runs when we're out of hot air, but that feels, I don't know, a little bit concerning. Anyway, that's hot air from Molten Salt. Now, I realize, and you will tell me this, I'm sure, that this doozy was not required because there is another method of coke processing which produces 500 degree gas. But, like, that requires steam and stuff, and it's just, it's, it's just more complicated. And we did do this process at some point, but for the sake of something like this, it wasn't necessary. We just needed more hot air, and we needed it now. And then we had it, and we have so much, we will never run out. That's a, that's a lie from the pit of hell. We definitely will run out at some point, and then we'll have to make more. But that will hopefully be later. Okay, are you ready for Power System 2 Oppression Boogaloo? Now with brownout protection? You may notice that the system I'm about to show you is on its own power network using only 109 megawatts. We'll talk about that more at the end. Awog power generators are what you might call a day job for awogs. They and their cute little turtle shells walk around in a circle for hours on end, and then they get tired. Look at that little depleted red energy bar. You know, everyone gets tired of a long day of work. We all know it. Now, there's two options to get these awogs. Both are pretty common, but one is worse than the other in a qualitative sense. You can just make awogs in awog paddocks and send them to your power systems. Many people do this. But whatever shall you do with your tired awogs if you do that? As it turns out, there's a recipe to full render tired awogs and slaughter them for being too tired to make you power. I heavily judge anyone who takes this method. I'm just kidding. It doesn't matter. It's a game. But I will say the other option is more fun because you can get awogs back up to speed by feeding them awog food. What's especially cute about it is that they have their little feeding times in these Pyfoon bays. They get lovely little vacations to relax after a long day at work in a sea or a pool or a cabana. And they get delicious food made just for them. It's not even artificial. And after they're fed, they're spry and ready to make more power. And you do not slaughter them. Now, as it happens, you can also feed tired awogs with meat, and you do get meat from slaughtering your tired awogs. So if you wanted to, and you didn't want to make as many awogs for your power system, you could just slaughter them and feed them to each other. And you would still have to add new awogs to the system, but less. But why do that when you can make a gigantic setup dedicated to making all the awog food necessary to make power? This setup is not exactly zero input, but it's very low input. It requires a little bit of coal and a little bit of stone and keratin. The awog food itself does not require too many complex things. The native flora, relesia, moss, and seaweed are not bad. The relesia is probably the biggest build, because it would have been way bigger if we didn't use the slightly better recipe that involves soil and hydrogen. With soil and hydrogen, our setup only needed a measly 32 relesia plantations. And it was a little more logistically challenging, and it required more power, but goddammit, it was worth it! The moss required stone, and stone created kerogen, but as you can see, we need kerogen more than we need stone. Processing kerogen into shale oil into light oil allowed us to break light oil down into aromatics and gasoline, and we needed those aromatics to help make plastic, which was also used in a wog food. The excess fluids we turned into steam in oil burners, because that steam was needed for pretty much just the wog food, but it's still a fairly substantial amount. Oh, and also the steam to break down kerogen into shale oil and break down shale oil into constituent fluids. The other thing we needed for plastic, like I mentioned, is the syngas, which is why we have the coal input. We kind of just get rid of the coke. Some of it turns into um, concrete um, that we have never accessed, and wow, this warehouse is actually filling up. I should make a note of this. But the rest is prepared to just get burned in this boiler when it um, overflows. But the point was really to turn coal gas into syngas, um, with the added benefit of turning some of the tar into carbon dioxide and aromatics. We forgot some gas vents and some balancing procedures, and we messed up our system several times and had many brownouts. 
So be very careful when you design your fluids, because we made mistakes. But eventually we sorted it out, we made sure that all of the things that need to run always run, and that we void anything that um, prevents us from running. We have a little tank here storing carbon dioxide in case things go kaput, because it is the most reliant of other processes of all the fluids. Anyway, with the powers of Belizea, native flora, seaweed, moss, and plastic combined, and a little help from some steam, we got our awog food. And now we are feeding our awogs to their heart's content. They slave away at their cute little day jobs and then go to relax before they have to go back to the monotony of daily life. With no chance of ever breaking that cycle, we'd never let them. They will never die. But I can tell you, there's some great reading material in these Pi-Foon Bays. Honestly, the animal stuff in Pi Alien Life is just so good, and I would recommend using all of it to everyone. Like, what a fun little way to make power. It's so different. And I mean, it, it's ultimately plug things in and get power, but it's, it's, it, it has lore. And it has mild logistical challenges. It's also convenient because it has very nice inbuilt um, brownout protection. A log power, while very strong, is split up across many generators. So if you just portion off like four of them to run your awog power, as long as the build itself is actually working and has not lost necessary materials, this will never actually brown out because it protects itself. That's not so easy in a build like this coal power plant because these power plants are massive. And the steam turbines each create a lot of power, 118 megawatts each. So just disconnecting one of them and using it to run the coal power plant, which itself takes very little power to run, it just feels bad. Like, we only have seven of these. If anyone has other ideas for how we can do brownout protection for something like this coal power plant, I would love to hear them. I have a vague inkling that it might involve siphoning off some pressurized steam, potentially, and making sure that steam goes to a special turbine which focuses on powering the coal power plant. If that makes sense, please tell me. If anyone has ideas for brownout protection, please tell me. I feel like it's easy to forget to do brownout protection, but Arch and I have a policy to try and do it wherever we can. And of course, if you have any ideas for naming these builds with cute acronyms, remember the two builds today were coal power plants and a wog power plant. We would love to hear them. For now, however, that's it for today's episode. As always, if you have any feedback, I'd love to hear it. I hope you enjoyed!